before we, we get into uh, back to uh, the myths and so on and so forth, I found something that is very good, especially for Nick and Albert. In the August, um, you know what I do? Don't tell anybody, but the August 10th edition of Newsweek, I go to these doctor's offices whenever I have to go to the doctor. I don't want to, you know, I have my annual checkup, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I, looked in, I look in their magazines, they have Newsweek, and I find the best stuff in doctors and dentist offices. So then I have to get it. I mean, I can't take the whole book, because that would be stealing. <laughs> so what I do is I go, <coughs> and you cough, and then you can rip the page out, and nobody, you know. I know you shouldn't do that, but I'm confessing, just like Bubba, and, um, um, so I've confessed on television, and uh, I guess you would, huh? Dr. Rosef would have given you the whole magazine. Yeah. I guess you, but Dr. Rosef, I'm, I'm confessing the whole thing. I was guilty of inappropriate behavior in Dr. Rosef, so. <laughs> well, anyway. You won't be good at it, huh? I'll buy him a new magazine if it really becomes essential. Okay. But anyhow, in that issue of Newsweek, there is something in there that strongly supports the final statement that we made concerning Adam and Atom. And, you know, it, it really ties it together. So it won't take long, but just for a couple of a moments, I just wanted to, to take a look at it. You remember, initially, we had stated that it seemed reasonable to consider that the biblical account of God taking a rib from Adam to make Eve was actually, or logically, could be considered as saying, well, life came from the splitting of the Adam. And we then suggested that, at least I suggested, that in this fission, an electron could be what is discussed as the rib in, in, in the Bible. But with some prompting from some scientifically based friends, I learned that in fission, an electron does not leave the atom. So back to the drawing board. And we did find that there is something called an ionic bond. When two of the atoms bond together, an electron moves from one atom to the other. Agreed? Agreed. See, I got my little, uh, you know, my scientific, uh, what do they call these in the churches? Uh, deacons or duchess or duches or whatever they are. <laughs> Deaconesses and duckets and all that stuff. Well, these are the two ducks from the, uh, <laughs> but they agree. Okay. So we found that. In other words, let me, if I can, uh, I don't know if you can see me, but if, if I can uh, get this here on this overhead, Maybe if I put this here, this will s okay, and okay, we can look at it that way, and that's fine. I mean, basically the same thing. But you could see what happens here is that sodium chloride does not exist until one electron leaves one atom and joins this other one, and then the two come together, they bond together, and then where there was not sodium chloride before it happens. And this is how you have an ionic bond. A and it says the atoms of some elements gain or lose electrons. In order to achieve a stable arrangement, atoms that have gained or lost electrons are called ions. Because each electron has a negative charge, the gain creates a negative ion, and the loss of electron creates a positive one. The attraction between negative and positive results in strong bond. So anyhow, let me just do this. And just for the fun of it, and <clears throat> we get an idea. OK, can you, is that right there? OK, so we get an idea. Right now, <clears throat> these are neutral, OK? And nothing basically. Is, is going to happen. So what I, let me see if I can, if I can somehow, I've never done this before, let me see if I, can, if I can read this and do this. In the Newsweek article, if we consider the movement 
eventually what we're going to have here, this one's going to be Adam, and this one's going to be Eve. Okay? So if we consider that the rib being taken from Adam is this electron, the rib leaves Adam and goes and into this Adam and it becomes Eve. Uh, or it's actually, what we're saying is it's actually an electron. But in the Newsweek article, this is what's interesting. It says that initially all was neutral. And the word that was used from which Adam came from is ha-adam. And ha-adam means from the earth. It does not male, not female, just neutral, nothing. You know I mean, it, it's there, but it, it is a neutral element, uh, denoting a being created from the earth. According to Newsweek, this word describes a creature of undifferentiated sex, a neutral atom. So we have two neutral atoms, okay? Now, when God, it said Newsweek goes on to say that when God takes a rib from Ha-Adam, that's the time when the sexes are differentiated and the change is signaled by a new terminology. In other words, everything is neutral here, but when God takes a rib from Adam, then everything changes. Okay? And what happens then? The creation is from when the rib is taken, this atom then becomes a positive ion, and when this atom receives the rib, it becomes a negative ion. And so then you have the basis of all life. You have positive, negative, male, female, yin, yang, light, darkness, and so forth, okay? But this is the interesting part. When this rib is taken from Adam in the book, it means the electron is leaving this atom, okay? And then this one is no longer referred to as ha Adam, but is now called ish. Okay? I-S-H. And what that means is male. But it only happens after it loses the, uh, the rib. It only happens after the electron leaves this atom, it becomes this. When the electron goes into the other atom, this atom is now called I-S, let me make sure that I get it right. It's called I-S-H-S-H-A-H. I S H S H A H. Isha. So here they both are ha adam, neutral. Then the atom loses a rib, it becomes ish. This atom gains a rib, it becomes isha. In other words, nothing could happen as far as life was concerned until you have a positive and negative. And this whole thing then were bonded together as one. They received a bonding together as one. This was Zish, this was Zisha, but only after the river was removed. And I thought that was really, really fascinating because it's absolutely exactly how science describes the ionic bond. So basically, what Newsweek is saying here in this article, it says the very, listen to this, Albert and Nick, the very act of creating woman at the same time created man. Huh? At the very act of creating, they're neutral, but when we're going to make a woman, at the same time that we made a woman, we made a man. It was the act of making woman that made man. Ha'adam became Ish. Ha'adam became Isha. There was an ionic bonding. They bonded together and formed the basis of all life. And heat. Yes. When that occurs. Wow. Wait a minute. Can we go? Hold on. Go ahead. The one thing that happens also is heat. So you, if, you, if you have them together, it's not only do they come together, but heat. And energy. Energy. OK. Very good. Okay, yes. Uh, is there a language on that? Is there a, do you know what language that's from? Th this ish in but it's it, um, well, yeah. it's 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 probably out of the ancient Aramaic or you know the whatever they called it. But that was the initial name was Ha Adam meant Adam 
neutral. And then when the ionic bond takes place, this becomes ish, this becomes isha, and they come together. Do you see the words Ishmael in there too? Yes. You know, you can, you can really now, you can start to come up with a lot of stuff here. But isn't that, you know, I really was fascinated by that uh, because of the fact that here looking in, um, looking in Newsweek magazine, we come up with a documentation. To me, there's no question whatsoever that now there, there definitely was being explained in the Bible the change from the neutral atom to the positive and negative male, female, light, dark, yin and yang. Ha Adam, one became Ish, the other became Isha. When? Only when the rib moved from one to the other. Only when the electron moved from one to the other. So I think that that solidifies without any question the fact that uh, we fit this right. What do you think? Sounds good? Yes. Okay. Anyhow, I, I, I wanted to share that with you because uh, I got all excited. You know, here I'm sitting in the doctor's office and I knew I had to have this helper. <laughs> so I coughed and just ripped and left. You know. I'll confess someday. Uh -huh. <laughs> huh? I didn't want to take any chances. They might have said they don't, it's not working. I don't even. Anyhow, let, 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 let's go back now and start because I want to take you into the boat of Sharon. And the reason I want to take you into the boat of Sharon is because, remember something, Sharon is a mythological character. Sharon represents something deep inside of you. Um, you might be able to get your old things out and remember a fellow by the name of Samael. Okay. Sharon also is a real live satellite to a planet in the sky called Pluto. So what I am saying here and what the mythologists were talking about was not just some wacky story. They're talking about something that's going to happen and it will involve the planet Pluto in the electromagnetism that is causing the upheavals on the Earth and will really do a number. Now when is Pluto going to be restored to its position at the gate of the netherworld? March 15th, 1999. I mean, take it to the bank. I'm not talking about and the astrological houses, I'm talking about a position of a planet. It restores its place at that position, at the place of the netherworld, March 15th, 1999. There are only two planets you can't see unless you have a telescope. One is Pluto, the other is Neptune. Right now, Neptune is holding Pluto. And remember something, Neptune is also Poseidon, who is the god of the sea, but also the god of earthquakes. Bingo. Okay, all right, well, we'll talk about that. Uh, Let's just, let me just sum up a few things for you. <laughs> One of the things that I want, maybe Rich, you can get after this, because Rich, the Doppler method, he usually comes up with stuff that's pretty good. Um, you know, looking back is all of a sudden, in the middle of people splitting rocks and doing weird things in our civilization as we evolved into, you know, human beings, some strange people showed up. They knew everything. And they were called Greeks. They're not the same people as we know Greeks today. Greeks today are natural, normal, nice people. Some are smart, some are not so smart. You know, they do, you know, normal things. These people were not normal. They knew everything. There was a guy named Democrates who talked about the atom, how the atom was formed, what it was, what happened to it, and I want to know who told him, because there was nobody else around. There was a guy by the name of Plato, probably one of the smartest guys. You know, you talk about did Jesus exist? There's no doubt Plato did. His books, you can even, they're published. One's called The Republic. This guy started a school in Greece called the Academy, and one of his students was a guy named Aristotle. You know, where did these, these people knew everything about science, medicine, Astronomy, uh, numerology, Pythagoras, uh, 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 poetry, everything. Who were they? And, and then when the Romans came, they disappeared. Where'd they go? Where'd they come from? And yet they left us with the names of the planets. They left us with the words in the Bible. They left us with the great myths. And they left us with the very words that describe the organs in your body. 
Who the heck were these people? Where'd they come from? Where'd they go? <laughs> when you look at their, you know, these gods and so forth, remember it's all talking about astronomical things, it's also talking about things inside of your head. And the earliest group of, of divinities in, in Greek were called Titans, and they were led by Kronos, and Kronos is time. You always know, see a picture of Kronos in New Year's Eve, you know, the old guy that's got the sickle and the long beard and so forth. That's time. That's the thing that, that, that you really can do you and does this all in is time. Kronos also is known as Saturn in the sky. The works of Kronos are carried out by Saturn. And in the Bible, known as Satan. The most powerful group of divinities in Greek were called the Olympians. And there are several ranks existed, but they had six gods and six goddesses, which is the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 constellations, winds up being the 12 disciples, and the 12 cranial nerves in your brain. The 12 cranial nerves in your brain are the 12 Olympians, six gods, six goddesses. There are also nine muses and three cyclops. It all breaks down into variations like this. The gods were Zeus, who was the ruler of all the divinities, Apollo, the god of music, Aris, the god of war, Hephaestus, who was the blacksmith for the gods, Hermes, who was the messenger, and Poseidon, who was the god of the ocean, but the god of earthquakes. Very interesting, him being the god of earthquakes as well as the god of the ocean, because remember, he was the father of Pegasus. And we have proved that Pegasus is the hippocampus of the brain. The white seahorse is Pegasus. The white seahorse is the hippocampus of the brain. And so now we are positioning there, not only at this point of enlightenment, but also the place of earthquakes, the shattering down of memories, the restoration of memories, and so forth and so on, which can cause the entire civilization to crumble. You don't need a real earthquake. If everybody has this change in the mind, change in consciousness, that's the earthquake because that's what will manifest in the, in the change that everybody is, is expecting. The goddesses, ladies, were Athena, who uh, was the goddess of wisdom and war, I might say. And this one I, I think most of you remember from the old movies you used to see, Aphrodite. Yeah? She was the goddess of love. And you remember Artemis, who was the, the twin sister of Apollo. And remember Artemis took her place there as the constellation Ursa Major as well. And her son Arcus was the North Star at that time. And then there was Demeter, who's the goddess of agriculture. Hera, who is the sister and wife of Zeus. And Hestia, who is the goddess of the hearth. And, and, and three important gods were associated with the 12 Olympians. And one was called Hades, ruler of the netherworld. Now the point is, and this is something that the, the, the writers from wherever they came from tried to say, we have turned Hades into hell and we got crazy you know, things with horns and pitchforks going around and sticking everywhere. That's, you have to get to Hades. It is absolutely essential that you get to Hades if you're going to make it to Elysium. Mm -hmm. You have to go there. And basically what's being said, it, it connects it with Pluto, which is going to happen to the entire Earth and the entire universe as Pluto acts. But what's also being said is you have to go into the dark netherworld, which is yourself, in order to find the shores of Elysium. You have to. You can't get to Elysium, heaven in, in the Christian vernacular, unless you go through Hades. And there is a river, and it splits into two. And one goes to the left, and one goes to the right. And you can't avoid the little guy, colored gray with the short cloak, whose name is Charon. Mm. Ah, sorry. Sounds a little bit like a ride in Disneyland, but it, you know, it's neat. And it's, you connect them all. As you understand the story, connect it to what is going to happen. Because remember, Charon is actually a little gray satellite that circles Pluto. The interesting thing about this is it wasn't named, that little satellite wasn't named Charon until about 30, 40 years ago. Somebody knew. And it circles Pluto. And Pluto is connected with Hades. Pluto is Hades. Okay. The other, uh, incidentally, Hades was the ruler of the underworld. 
and the brother of Zeus. And if you look in your Bible, you'll find that he exists in the Bible under the name of Lucifer. Oh, how you have fallen. You sat up among the gods, and now you have fallen. Actually, what's being described there is Venus, the star. Venus, which is the star of the morning and rises up and then falls down to the earth. But if you look in the book of Lucifer, and you look in on page 588, if you have a Bible, if you want to look at it, it's in Isaiah 14, chapter 12. And it says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground. It's talking about Venus. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Well, Hades was the brother of Zeus. And Lucifer is placed in that position with, quote, unquote, God. See? And, and another of the gods that we had in, in Greek is the reason that you take um, bread and wine when they have communion in the ch churches because the god's name is Dionysius. Dionysius was the god of wine. Before the culture came west, they took bread and beer because the god was Osiris and he raised out of the uh, 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 wheat. And so they took the, 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 the malt and, from the barley and, and made beer and then the wheat they made bread. So they took bread and beer. That was a very important thing because prior to that time, they were taking people and they were taking the smartest one. In other words, the smartest one in here would um, you'd, you'd eat the p person, you know, and then it's like, well, we're all like that. That's where this all started from. But the cult of Osiris went to the bread and beer thing to try to knock off of that cannibalism, which they were successful in doing. And then when the culture moved to Greece, it no longer was bread and beer, it became bread and wine because Dionysius replaced Osiris as, as the god there. There was another god, the god of the forest. And the god of the forest, we'll talk about so sometimes, called Pan. And Pan, and there was a little nymph who had, you, I'll talk about the Narcissus story in a minute, but there was a little nymph who was part of, of, of the forest named Echo. So whenever you go and say, hello, hello, that's, that's Echo. You know, anyhow. There were several minor groups, and, and the nymphs lived in the forest, and there were nymphs that lived in the sea. And the nymphs that, that controlled the destiny of every living being were called fates, F A. T E S. The fates controlled your destiny. Okay? That's where you get this stuff from. I mean, these, who were these people that wrote? There were nine muses, as you know. And the nine muses lived on Mount Helicon. And the word helicon means spiral. And the muses' mother was Monosomy, who's the goddess of memory. And the memory came out of the spiral fountain. The spiral road rolled up to the top of Mount Helicon, and there was a fountain, but it never gave water. It never gave understanding. It never gave wisdom. It never gave memory. And then one day, a magnificent winged white horse flew down and kicked the top of Mount Helicon with his hoof, and the water poured for Pegasus had charged Mount Helicon and became sacred to the muses and became connected to memory and the spiral energy of Kundalini, of meditation. That was great. So then basically is the origin of our religion and which Joseph Campbell, remember how Joseph Campbell, I told you a few weeks ago, described religion. Two words, great, great description. Misunderstood mythology. That's what Joseph Campbell said religion is, misunderstood mythology. So you wanted more information about Sharon. You can call him Chiron, whatever. You pronounce him C-H, or you spell it, Sharon, C-H-A-R-O-N, all right? He was a ragged old boatman of the underworld. Now. 
His father was Erebus, which means darkness. And his mother was Nyx, N-Y-X, which means night. In other words, for you to find the ragged boatman, to take you across the river Styx, you must enter into the place of deep darkness, of deep night. You know, what I found when I was looking at that, I found on page 747 in the Bible, in the book of Amos, in the book of Amos, on page, uh, what did I say, 747, uh, there is in Amos chapter 5, two references here that I think are interesting. In Amos chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you the day of the Lord is darkness and not light? And then in verse 20 it says, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Now it's very important for you to understand Sharon's mom and dad are Nix and Erebus, darkness and night. Hmm? So to be ferried across the sticks, you must enter into the realm of darkness and night, which is meditation. Interestingly too, isn't it strange that it is in the realm of this darkness and night that the pineal gland opens within the human body? <coughs> the little light to help you find your way down the crooked pathway through the swamps and through the gray, murky edge of the dark waters to Sharon. Sharon ferried groups across the sticks, and they're called shades. The ancient Greeks buried the dead with a silver coin in the mouth because Sharon must be paid the toll. Now, just understand something. Silver, metaphysically, in Greek, means the mind. The number 30 in Greek is the god or goddess Sin, S-I-N. Okay? When Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he was betrayed by 30 sin pieces of silver, the mind, the sin of the human mind. Huh? That's what it was. There was no, yeah, this is all code. Okay. So, now when we look at this about Sharon, what I'm telling you here is that Sharon and Pluto, the gate to the netherworld, will assume its position for the Earth, for the universe, on March 15th, 1999. Hmm? Okay. Pluto is the planet of the dead. And the reason is that it becomes the most distant planet and the last one before the netherworld. I struggled to the top of Pluto, climbing up on top. And when I finally reached the top, I looked down. And there in the distance, I can see the glimmer of light from Elysium. And Pluto has a small grayish planet, whatever, orbiting it, satellite orbiting it, and it's called Charon. So what you hear here that goes on in the book, which will go on in your head, is going to go on on the Earth. Hades, as I said, was, uh, was the god of the dead in Greek mythology, and he ruled the kingdom of the dead, and uh, then was also given the name and the attachment to the planet Pluto. All right. I don't, uh, okay, I'll show you this. Hades was the son of two folks that you know. They had a lot of children. He was the son of Kronos, which is time, 
and Rhea, the earth. And his brother was Zeus, as I told you in the Bible, he's Lucifer. And, and Hades is a neutral place. It's, it's not a, it's, it wasn't a, a bad place. It's a place that you had to go in order to find understanding and wisdom. And this is what it's talking about. You, when you enter into yourself, you go into the dark places, the dark waters of Hades. And then you'll find that light that takes you to Elysium where you will be given understanding about who you are, what you did before, where you came from, but before you return, you must drink from the waters of Leth. Lake Leth, L-E-T-H-E. And when you drink from the waters of Leth, you'll forget. They won't let you come back unless you do. The Greeks, uh, the, there was five rivers in, that left around Hades. One is called Acheron, the other is called Kokitos, the one is Leth, Phlegathon, and the Styx. The Styx was the best known, and of course Sharon works the Styx, and he demanded payment. And there's one thing as you go across, and the waters are very quiet, and all you can hear is Sharon's stick, you know, pole that goes through the water. But as you get near the house of Hades, there is a three-headed dog in the yard called Cerebrus. And most have been able to dissuade him with a little piece of cake. I'll explain that to you a little later. Styx is a very gloomy, dark river. With all those things hanging down from the trees and and the word Styx in Greek means hateful. The boatman Sharon takes you across the river Styx. Do you understand what's being said here? Inside, in the darkness of your own mind, you will be ferried across that river of hate, of fear, of guilt, of the river Styx. But you have to go there. The Styx, they, they feel that there was a place in Greece called Arcadia where the water would plunge down from a cliff down a steep gorge to the underworld and then find its way to this place. Now, Pluto then, as I said, is usually the most distant planet from the sun. And Pluto and Neptune are the only two planets that you can't see without a telescope. Pluto is about 30 to 39 times as far from the sun as the Earth is. It travels around the sun in an elliptical type of, elliptical type of orbit. Uh, orbit. At some point, it comes closer than the sun to Neptune, but it stays inside Neptune's orbit for about 20 Earth years. But every 248 years, it moves out. And it takes its position as the keeper of the netherworld. Let me show you. It'll be there on, uh, it'll be there on uh, March 15th, 1999. And I'll show you what the setup will look like then. So you get an idea of, of, of what this is going to look like. I think we can see. OK, so if you see here, th here's the sun. This is the sun, OK? And the closest, and you have Mercury and Venus, OK? Then you have the Earth. You have the Mars, Mars here, the red horse. And then Jupiter and Saturn. And here's Uranus. Uranus is the one that's ruling the show right now. It's the one that's returning to claim his bride, who is Gaia, little Earth here. There's Neptune, and right now there's, there's Pluto. And Pluto is actually inside of Neptune's orbit, but Pluto will ascend back to its proper position on March 15th, 1999. And then Pluto will control the gate to the netherworld. And orbiting around Pluto, way up there, is Charon. 
And in the same way that you move here, if you had a spaceship, you move in your meditation through all of these relative uh, planets until you reach the place of Hades and until you reach the place of Sharon. Okay? Now, March 15th, 1999, Pluto assumes its place as Pluto assumes its place within you as the keeper of the gate to the netherworld. <sighs> Sharon is a form of Samael, which we've talked about, which means that, once again, a Zosio will play a very important part in all of this, as well, the symbol of eight, okay? <sighs> and the silver coin. These are all symbols. But it's important because Pegasus has already been accounted for in the discoveries. Supernova 1987A is accounted for as the pineal. We understand the fornix of the brain as the fornax constellation. We understand the temple as Dura Mater, Pia Mater, Arachnoid. And then Pluto will open the gate to the other realms. And Sharon will beckon each one of you. And do you want to cross? Do you have the silver coin? Silver coin, the silver coin, the word silver metaphysically in the Greek myth means the mind. And basically it's, in other words, have you achieved the point of the renewed mind that you understand? I mean, this, what, I, what we're talking about here is, is complete, oh, it's Greek to these people who are walking down the street, you know. And, and understand all of these things in the realm. Everything is symbolic until you get to the point of Pluto. There's a real vibration. There's a real something that's going to happen in relationship to Pluto and, and Uranus and all of these things that's, affect, that's going to affect the Earth. And, and I mean, you know, I'm not telling you anything that can't be proved. Just like NASA has proved that, you know, the light from um, supernova will hit the Earth 2000, 2002. But Sharon's going to open the gate before that, as, as we see. Okay. Now, don't think of, of Hades or where we're going here as hell as, as we learned in the Christian. It's the place where wisdom is to be found. And the reason that you know some things or the reason that you feel some things about this is because you've been to Elysium, but you've drunk from the river of Leth. Okay? So, in the same way that you go in to yourself in the same way that you go into the mythology to find this, in the same way this is what's going to happen big time as Pluto asserts itself. See, before you can get into Sharon's ferry boat, you also have to have with you the golden bough, B-O-U-G-H. You can't go. They won't let you go unless you have that. And let me tell you, as a friend, what the golden bough is. The golden bough is the pineal gland on fire. Now, in supernova 1987 is the pineal gland which is going on fire. So you see all these connections. The golden bough, the pineal on fire, must be active before you can go. In the sky, the pineal is actually going on fire. And Pluto is about to take its place. Everything is, everything is going right to where it has to go. And the golden bough is on a tree. And the tree is your body. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know, how when you are going in to yourself, what you're really doing is looking for the golden bough. What you're really doing is looking for the pineal gland to light in the same way that we're waiting for the supernova to light. And you look, and, and how many times when you go into meditation, you look and deep within yourself, and you can't see anything. And you can't find anything. You know? And there's nothing in here. And you say, well, I wasted a half hour. I sat here. I didn't hear music. I didn't hear. I didn't find anything. And then when you think in the darkest time, suddenly what will happen is two doves will fly above you. And they're called the birds of Venus. 
and they follow you and you follow them and you look and, and, and sometimes your experience will be very brief but I'm putting these suggestions into your head because in your meditation you're going to see them. And you follow these two doves and they'll bring you as you follow them to a place called Lake Avernus, A-V-E-R-N-U-S and it's a dark, foul-smelling water where there is a cavern that leads to the deeper place. But that foul-smelling water that this world will find as it gets closer to Pluto is the same thing that you find that runs within each one of us. It is the truth which has been polluted by all the systems of the world and it smells foul. And then as you go deeper and deeper into yourself, you experience all of the things screaming and yelling and moaning and dancing by the lit moon and all of this wild stuff. And then you find out that all of that, all of the screaming, all of the, are all of the fears and all of the hurts and all of the guilt and all of the things which have tried to destroy you and have been put inside of you by all of the systems of the earth. And you're just about ready to quit because all of this howling and all of this frightening and these things that go on inside of us every day and you figure, well, I am meditating and I'm going deeper into the darker place. But suddenly, you pass through all of these things. It's like crossing the Red Sea in the Bible and you, and you, and you cross and you're not touched by any of this because it's all fear. It only was fear. It wasn't anything real, but it was fear. And then when you get past all of that howling and screaming, which are the thoughts of the mind, and in that dark place of the inner reaches of this consciousness, finally, suddenly, in the midst of it all, there is the two doves suddenly soar up above you, up towards the sky, and as you look up and you see a golden bough. The pineal gland has been reached. And you reach up to take the golden bough. And then you struggle through the forest and you pass through all the places of fear and you come to this river and there you'll see this little gray man pulling his boat among the mists of this dark river. <sighs> and there are two rivers there. One is called Coxitus, C-O-C-Y-T-U-S. Some of you who are, I tried to connect this, I haven't been able to so far, but I've got a funny feeling that it's connected to the coccyx, which is the base of the spine where all this starts. The other is Acheron. And then when, oh, when Sharon sees you, he lifts his hand up and says, stop! Don't come any further. No, I told you about Samael a long time ago? Don't come any further. You lift your golden bow, and we'll involve these other things. You lift your golden bow, and Sharon says, come in, and you sit. Be quiet. And as you go down this dark river sticks, the dog is barking in the front yard, and you appease him with a piece of cake, which is the, which is the, the degree that you have to compromise with the system. It's OK. And then you pass the solemn place where Minos, which is Europa's sun, Europa is a moon, was passing sentence on falling souls, which is more fear within us. And you pass the fields of mourning where unhappiness dwells. And all these things inside of you, but you're finally moving through it. Your meditation is starting to plug in, starting to hold. And at last, in your dark, darkest point of meditation, Sharon's pole into the river sticks brings you to a place where there were two rivers. They split. And from the left side of the river you hear these horrible sounds and groans and fighting and savage cries and you stare at terror to the left side. But in spite of your fear you hold on to the golden bow and Sharon pushes the skiff to the right and the quiet waters touch the side of the skiff and suddenly the sky is brightened. 
suddenly through all of this, the sky is brightened, and you come to the beautiful field of greens and colors and trees and waterfalls and birds and living things, and you've come to the fields called Elysium. And you see people who are your relatives, your father, your mother, your cousins, all of these sons and daughters, all of these, getting ready to come back. And you say, well, why is everybody drinking? And they're drinking from Leth. And you must drink from Leth because as they come back, they have drunk from the rivers of forgetfulness. And you'll never remember a thing, never. Of all of the exciting experiences that you've had, and you don't remember a bit of it because you've drunk from the river of Leth before you were allowed to return. <laughs> all the memories of the former times is gone, and then all of us together calmly knowing, preparing to leave. And the wisdom is given to you, the understanding is given to you, and you're ready to come back. All of this has happened inside of yourself in meditation. All of this happens in the myth, but all of this is going to happen to the earth. The golden bough is now supernova, 1987a. Eridanus is the river that, that runs by the constellation Fornix, and Sharon waits at Pluto until March 15th. He's got a few days vacation, a few weeks vacation, but then he's got to get back in his skiff on March 15th, and we've got to be ready. Do you remember your last trip? Don't have a clue, do you? <laughs> All of that you went through and you don't, you don't remember the howling dog? You don't remember all that screaming and all that stuff, dancing, all those loons, all that stuff? You don't remember anything. You don't remember the two doves flying over your head? You don't remember the golden bow? You don't remember any of it. What do you think? Because. Before you went back, you drank the cup from Reth, from the river Leth, and you didn't remember. But you did. You were there, and you're going back, and this whole earth is going back. And now this whole thing is going to happen. And there'll be all of the screaming, and all the howling, and all the savagery, and all of these things. And you have got to keep saying to Sharon, to the right, to the right, to the right, to keep yourself free of that. Don't you remember the experience in your last meditation when you separated from your thoughts? I mean, you couldn't think of anything. You got lost. All of a sudden, you fell off the end of the world. You didn't know you were in Elysium. And all these things are waiting for such a short time. Pluto at the gate of Hades, Sharon the variable, Elysia, the golden bow now, which is supernova 1987a, is going on fire. What is this, a big coincidence? It's going on fire right over your head in the sky. Pictures of it in the pictures of it in National Geographic on the front page. And the white horse Pegasus raising itself in preparation for the one who sends the lightning, the enlightenment from the hippocampus. All the planets and constellations waiting and in preparation. And in all of the middle of this, there's a little gray man with a short gray cloak and a little toothless grin, and he looks at you and he says, You want to go? <laughs> Come on, Judy. <laughs> the way you're laughing at Cheryl. <laughs> but remember, you can't get to Elysium unless you go through all of the darkness and all of the howling and all of the screaming. And the way is within you. And the same way that is within you is the way that's coming upon the earth. And that's why Pluto is ready to ascend to the point of the netherworld gate. And that's why Sharon is about ready to pick up his pole and get back to his skip. And that's why Uranus is coming back to claim his bride. And that's why Supernova is about to go on fire and send that fire racing down to the Fornax, which is the oven, which will explode and has already opened to us the fourth that we never saw before. All of these things happening, just as the mythologists said, just as these strange people who came from a strange place and called themselves Greeks of that period knew and, and, and gave us this. So this is beautiful. This is the exciting time. And even, you know what's so funny about this? 
even your universities, most brilliant people in universities, have gone into colleges of renown and been given courses in Greek mythology. The most brilliant people have studied mythology. A guy by the name of Joseph Campbell, where did he come from? Who was he? Taught for 39 years and stood on television and told everybody all about it. Nobody paid a damn bit of attention to him. Because they were going to church. And they studied mythology that they didn't understand. But they wouldn't listen to the man who was explaining to them. And so what happens now? <laughs> what happens now when they see the little gray man with the pole and he says, come on, Pat. Get, get in the boat. You want to go. <laughs> you want a life preserver. Give me this silver coin. But you see, try to understand something in all of this story. It's talking about the darkness inside of you that you experience in meditation and the wild howling stuff, but the fact that there is a way as you steer to the right to avoid all that and come to the place of Elysia. That's one thing, and that's fine. We understand that. But there is something else it's talking about, that the planet Earth and all of the things is really coming to a point of this exact same thing happening. Okay, And it will happen through the alignment of these planets, constellations, and it will be heralded by supernova 1987A, which the scientists said will spread its light down here to approximately the year 2000, 2002. And the beginning of it in the boat of Charon will start activating itself March 15th, 1999, when Pluto, which is Hades, asserts itself um, as the key to the netherworld. And that's what it's all about. And... Uh, I'm glad that uh, I was able to share it with you, and uh, we look forward to, as the dip deepens, to understand more. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon.